Welcome to the Egalitarian Connection, your connection to Christians of Biblical Equality, Archaeology, and the Persecuted Church. Today we have a video for you from Christians of Biblical Equality. This video is from the Assemblies of God Convention on Ministry, um, on Women in Ministry. The title is The Theology of Women in Ministry with Dr. Deborah Gill. In this video, Deborah will give her clear and engaging presentation along with an overview of the status of women throughout the Bible. Well, accompanied by a PowerPoint presentation, her thorough treatment examines the women's status in creation through her status in Christ and the early church. Deborah Gill also examines problematic texts, providing a superior summary of what the entire Bible says about women in ministry. Once again, we can see and hear from another scholarly woman who is eager and willing to bring us God's truth about the need for women in Jesus Christ's ministry. All Christians, both men and women, have an, enorm an enormous responsibility to preach the gospel before Jesus Christ returns. This can achieve, be achieved more and accomplished more effectively when there is equality, mutuality, and harmony in Christ's egalitarian ministry. Jesus Christ will not accept any excuses from rebellious men who will exclude women from his ministry. We are all to be one in Christ Jesus, as the scripture says, if we want to be Abraham's seed. The Apostle Paul was inspired to write in Galatians 3.28 that there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male or female, but we're all one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Now let's hear from this inspired woman of God as she teaches us about women in ministry. Dr. Deborah Gill is, um, has the gift of bubbly, but within the framework of a PhD in Biblical studies, both Old and New Testaments. She is genuinely a scholar, but she is an anointed scholar. <laughs> and we have invited her to share this morning because this is not an easy topic. In today's world, there's much being said about what the Bible really says about women in ministry. And so we invited her to share this word because we trust her. We trust her integrity intellectually and spiritually. And that's a wonderful gift. And she brings that this morning to this topic. She has served many years as a teacher, as a professor, as an educator, but she's also served at times in missionary ministry. And then several years ago, she left teaching to become a pastor. So she now brings also to this pulpit the experience of a pastor, a woman pastor, and is really pastoring an excited church. And I believe the quote she used was, it's a young soul-based church on the verge of revival. And knowing her, when I saw that, I just thought, you know, no, for Deborah, she's always, everything she does is on the verge of something. <laughs> So it's very fitting that as we are on the verge of something and God is women in ministry, Dr. Deborah Gill comes to open her heart. Debbie? Thank you so much for the honor by extending the invitation to ask me to present the biblical basis for women in ministry and leadership. Since the allotment of time is very brief relative to the scope of this topic. I will only be able to touch on the peaks this morning. I will move quickly, but I prepared a PowerPoint presentation. Hopefully that will help you with graphics and text to catch the points. However, there is a six tape version of this talk available. <laughs> and I've been asked to mention that. It's, it's being used as a text for the AGTS class for this conference, and it's available at the Christians for Biblical Equality booth. I would commend that unabridged version for all who are serious about this topic. A proper starting point is essential to developing any biblical theology. You see, where we start has an awful lot to do with where we end up. 
and the conclusions we draw. Therefore, this study of the biblical basis for women in ministry is divided into four parts. We will begin at the beginning. First, examining the status of woman in creation as God intended her role to be. Such status is in sharp contrast to her position after the fall. Second, we will examine the status of woman in Christ who reversed the effects of the fall. Third, we examine the status of woman in the early church. Christian scripture makes it clear that the early church followed Jesus' example in its teaching and its practice, welcoming the ministry of women. All of the New Testament texts that have anything to do with women in ministry or leadership can be divided into three categories, normative texts, descriptive texts, and historical texts. Finally, problematic texts. Do you realize that in the entire New Testament, there are only two passages of Scripture that even appear problematic to the ministry and leadership of women? We will look very briefly at those two texts, present insights on each, and finally, we will highlight the status of women in the church today by presenting several contemporary models and prompting our appropriate response to this issue. Let's begin then with the status of women in creation. Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 through 28, talk about the status of women in creation before the fall. In the interest of the most literal translation, I'm reading from the NASB. Then God said, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the sky, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the sky, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Now the Hebrew word in this text that is rendered man is Adam, which means man only in the generic sense. It could more precisely be translated humanity or humankind. This word does not represent a male human being. The Hebrew has a different word for that, ish. Thus, we could render the text this way. God created humanity in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female. What these verses help us to see is that male and female are equally created in the image of God. Woman was not created in man's image as a secondary derived creature. Both are equally in the image of God. Almighty God is neither male nor female. Scripture says God is not a man. His nature is transcendent above sex. Jesus said God is spirit. This is probably why the commandments forbid making any graven images to represent Yahweh, either as male or female. Now, the use of the masculine pronoun for God is not ontological. That means it is not representative of the character of his being. It is merely a grammatical convention to represent a personal rather than an impersonal deity. In the New Testament, the doctrine of the incarnation, God becoming one of us, is never described in terms of Christ's maleness, but always in terms of his humanness. Though Jesus was male, his maleness is not an aspect of Christology. Do you realize every single text in the New Testament that talks about Jesus coming to earth in the original text uses the word human, never man as male person. The point of the incarnation is that the word became flesh, not that the word became male. Yahweh is not male, nor is maleness a factor in the image of God. 
Humanity, both male and female, are equally created in the image of God. Genesis 2, 18 through 25, then talks about the specific creation of the woman. The Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. So the Lord caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and as he slept, he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh at that place. And the Lord God fashioned into woman the rib he had taken from the man and brought her to the man. Then the man said, This now is bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of the man. For this cause, a man shall leave his father and mother and shall cleave to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. The man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. The Hebrew word for helper is Eitzer. This word is never used in the Old Testament for an inferior or a subordinate. In fact, 17 out of the 20 times it is used, guess who the helper is? God. The three other times the helper is an ally army. Helper suitable, or as the King James says, help meet, adds the word konegdo, which means corresponding to, implying equal to. Woman in creation was equal to man. We can summarize then the relationship between man and woman as it was in the beginning, initially in creation, with the following four characteristics. There was equality. They were of the same essence. Adam recognized that Eve was bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. God's command to both of them was to rule and to subdue the earth, not each other. There was mutuality. Fruitfulness and multiplication required teamwork. There was unity. God's plan was to leave and to cleave and to be joined as one flesh. And there was intimacy. They were naked but without shame. When we compare that picture, God's original design, to what happened after the fall, you will see what sin does to God's plan. Genesis 3, 14 through 19, describes the situation after the fall. The Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you. And the curse extends several verses. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel. To the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply your pain in childbirth. In pain you shall bring forth children. Yet your desire will be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. Then to Adam he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree about which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat of it, cursed is the ground because of you. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life both thorns and thistles it will grow for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, till you return to the ground, because from it you were taken. For you are dust, and to dust you will return. We see then the situation drastically changes after the fall. The entrance of sin changes God's design, changes the effect of how we see God's design. Fallen humanity imposes false distinctions. Equality was deposed. Subordination imposed. He ruled her. Unity was severed. Guilt brought accusatory behavior, passing the buck, shifting the blame. And intimacy was thwarted. Her desire was left unfulfilled. Now, unfortunately, there has been a tradition to put all the blame for the fall into sin on the woman. But such is not biblical. 
Scripture makes it clear that Eve is not solely responsible for all the penalties of sin. Adam is equally culpable. We know this because the woman is not punished alone. Adam, too, and all creation mutually bear the brunt of the curse. Indeed, she was the first to sin. But Scripture makes it clear that she was deceived and he was disobedient. The New Testament stresses the fact that it was Adam's sin which has resulted in our being born sinners. Now, verse 16 is often misunderstood as if it's God's command for the husband to rule over the wife. But the grammatical mood of this verse is indicative, not imperative. That is, it is predictive, not prescriptive. The man's ruling is not a command, but a sad commentary on the future state under sin. But in the midst of the curses, the one ray of hope is found in verse 15, the promise of salvation through the seed of the woman. Jesus Christ would one day come to restore God's plan again and reverse the effects of the fall into sin. Let's move then to look at the status of women in the first century. In order to see the impact of Christ's work, we must understand the historical situation in which he came. Although there were ups and downs to which the fall in sin affected women's status in religion and society, by the first century, things had gone from bad to worse. Let me summarize. In Greco-Roman society, among the pagans, women's status was significantly lower than a man's in the first century world. In Judaism, God's people, in formative Judaism, women's status had declined markedly from the religion of the Old Testament and the great female heroes God raised up there. By this time, women's role was to be domestic and maternal only. Women were considered inferior virtually in any way they could be viewed. Women were considered responsible for all sin and deviation in the world. They had very little status or role in religion or society. But it's in this social and religious context that Jesus came. And in light of that, Jesus' treatment of women was revolutionary. Nowhere in the Gospels do we see Jesus treating women as inferior beings. Instead, Jesus treated women as equal to men, even when it meant contravening social customs to do so. Jesus attacked the prejudices and neutralized their effects. Wherever the values of heaven were put into practice, his kingdom was established on earth. Effects of the fall were canceled by the surpassing effects of the cross, and woman's status was elevated to God's ideal. Originally created fully in the image of God, she is now fully redeemed by the work of Christ. To look at the status of woman in Christ and see the reversal of the effects of the fall, let's just take a quick look. I'm just going to list briefly some evidence of the impact of Jesus' example on the status of women from three perspectives. His ministry practice, the way he practiced his ministry was egalitarian. He, he treated men and women equally. Jesus treated women as persons. Jesus directed his ministry to them. Jesus showed women courtesy and compassion. Jesus expressed confidence in them. Jesus showed them great honor. Jesus taught women, had women disciples, and commissioned them to testify. Look at his teaching manner, the message and, and how it affected people. Very egalitarian, very equal. All of Jesus' teachings apply as equally to women as to men. Jesus balanced his parables 
with male and female activities so that both sexes could identify with the gospel. Jesus coupled illustrations for each sex. Jesus used gender-inclusive language before there was a term for it. Amazing. And Jesus was free to use feminine imagery for himself in describing Father God. Look at his doctrinal content. How egalitarian is his quality. There are no instructions in Jesus' theology that apply only to women and not to men. Jesus did not confine women's role to the domestic sphere only, but he served in those kinds of roles a number of times. In all the gospel records, Jesus never taught or preached the subordination of women. The good news of the gospel is there is freedom and equality for all people in Christ's kingdom. Jesus came to cancel the consequences of sin, to reverse the effects of the fall, to put right side up a world whose values were upside down. Hallelujah. David Scholler is a scholar who has analyzed the impact of Jesus' example on the status of women by answering the question, what did Jesus do for women? Let me just enumerate five big things Jesus did for women. What did Jesus do for women? Jesus challenged the sexual put-down of women. Remember the divorce debate? Remember the passage about the look of adultery? What did Jesus do for women? Jesus reached out to women who were despised and rejected. Remember the woman with the issue of blood? Remember the Samaritan woman? What about the woman caught in the act of adultery? What did Jesus do for women? Jesus included women in his larger group of disciples, Mary and Martha, the Samaritan woman, others mentioned by name in Luke 8, 1 through 3. What did Jesus do for women? Jesus valued the discipleship of women over their biological function. Twice when Jesus' mother was mentioned or being blessed for being his mother, Jesus said, oh, my mother and my brothers are those who hear the word of God and put it into practice. Jesus said, blessed rather than being my biological mother are those who hear the word and obey it. As lofty and honorable as the roles of wife and mother are, Jesus was asserting that there is still a higher value. He was not denying or diminishing maternity. He was just saying that discipleship is even a higher value. Not every woman will be a wife or a mother, but she can be Christ's follower. The highest role is serving God. Discipleship in Jesus' theology surpasses even motherhood. What did Jesus do for women? Jesus included women among those he commissioned to proclaim the gospel. The first proclaimers of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and this is Paul's definition of the gospel, were women. They were the ones that Jesus commissioned and the angels commissioned as the primary eyewitnesses of the resurrection. Now, Jesus didn't appoint any female elders. Do you know what? He never appointed any male elders either. <laughs> what Jesus did do is to call and commission disciples. And within his band of faithful disciples, there were both men and women. Now, Jesus' model is relevant. It is important. It is the foundation that led the early church to understand that the Holy Spirit had come to both men and women in fulfillment of the prophecy of Joel. It was Jesus' model that led Paul to say that in Christ there is no male nor female. Jesus' treatment of men and women equally in discipleship is the first basis of ministry. Well, what was the influence of Jesus' example on his disciples? They were so impressed by Jesus' example 
that they were faithful to record it, even though it was at variance with their own social customs. What was the influence of Jesus' example on subsequent church history? The church, in its early, original state, followed Jesus' example, celebrating it as the incarnation of the good news. With Jesus as a foundation, let's move now to the status of woman in the early church. The New Testament texts that pertain to the ministry and leadership of women in the church fall into three categories. There are theological statements that teach the way things ought to be. There are historical statements that describe the way things were. And there are contextual corrective statements that deal with local problems that need correction. This categorization into three lists is the work of Dr. S. Scott Barchi. Let me give you this list, and this is every verse in the New Testament that has anything to do with women in ministry and leadership in three separate categories. Here's the first list. These are the normative texts. They are the theological statements, the biblical theology, the way things are supposed to be. First one, Acts 2, 17 and 18. In the last days, all flesh, regardless of age, social status, or gender, qualified to preach Christ because it is the Holy Spirit that equips for ministry. 1 Corinthians 7, 4 and 5 and 7. In 1 Corinthians, Paul explains that in Christian marriage, it is to be a relationship of mutuality and reciprocal authority. Also, in Christ, there is equal respect for both the married and the single states. 1 Corinthians 11, verses 11 through 12. In this passage, Paul explains that even though there was a sequence of origination in creation, God, Christ, man, woman, yet now in Christ, neither man nor woman are independent of each other. And just as the first woman came from man, ever since Adam, every man has been born of a woman. But all of this is inconsequential. What really matters is all things come from God. Galatians 3, 26 through 29. This passage, and especially verse 28, has been called the Magna Carta of Christian equality. There is no male nor female in Christ. Ephesians 5, 22 is the topic sentence for the whole passage describing the roles of husbands and wives and members of the family. The ideal for the Christian family is mutual submission, submitting ourselves one to another in the fear of Christ. Let me summarize all of these normative texts. As the New Testament articulates the doctrine of the church, the eschatological nature of the kingdom is dominant. That means there's an emphasis that we are living in the last days when God's blessings and God's ministries are equally available to women and to men. These normative texts declare that in Christ's new creation, sexual hierarchical distinctions are abolished. Marriages are to be egalitarian. Submission is to be mutual. And headship, as modeled by Christ, means the facilitation of personal and spiritual fulfillment. Let's move now to the descriptive text, the second list. These are historical statements, just telling the way things were. Very little comment, very little theology. This is just what was happening, how God was using women in the first century. The first four texts from each of the four Gospels record how women were commissioned to testify of the resurrection. Matthew 28, 9 through 10, Mark 16, 7, and 9 through 11, Luke 24, 10 through 11, John 20, 14 through 18. Acts 9, 36 tells us of a female disciple named Dorcas. Acts 21, 8 through 9 tells about Philip's four virgin daughters who prophesied 1 Corinthians 11, verses 4 and 5, discusses the decorum 
expected of women who participate in public prayer and prophetic ministry in the congregation, thus confirming that they were permitted to lead in public prayer and they were involved in prophetic ministry. Philippians 4, 2 through 3, and Romans 16, that's a chapter worth studying, verses 1 through 7, verses 11, verse 13, verse 15, lists a whole host of women by name with ministry title who are commended by the Apostle Paul for their ministry. In the pastoral epistles, there was recognition of both male and female leaders in the offices of the church. 1 Timothy 3.11 should probably be translated not as qualifications for deacons' wives, but for female deacons. Titus 2.3 may be referring to female elders. Ancient inscriptional evidence has been discovered on the tombstones of women leaders from the first few centuries with all of the official titles of the offices of the church. Let me summarize this list of descriptive texts this way. The New Testament was very conscious of women. As the New Testament describes church life, women are pictured as full participants in the church's services equal recipients of all of the charismatic gifts, functioning in all ministries, and even sharing the same titles that men had from the level of saint to and including the level of apostle. The third category of texts are what I call, what Scott Barchi calls, problematic texts. These are contextual statements. They're limited to local situations where problems needed to be corrected in a particular congregation. There are only two texts in the entire New Testament which appear problematic relative to the ministry of women. And we can see they would be clearly self-contradictory of the Apostle Paul who lauds women for their ministry. Thus, we know these two verses cannot be absolute, unequivocal prohibitions of women in ministry. Instead, they should be seen as Paul's teachings dealing with specific local problems in certain congregations that needed correction. Now, the nature of just what is being prohibited and what is being corrected is probably best determined by trying to reconstruct the particular historical situations surrounding these texts. Background information from ancient sources and trying to read between the lines of Paul's arguments help us with historical reconstructions of the Corinthian and the Ephesian churches. These will help us to be more accurate in how we interpret the texts. The first of those two passages is 1 Corinthians 14, 33 through 35. I quote, as in the churches of all the saints, let the women keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but let them subject themselves, just as the law also says. And if they desire to learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is improper for a woman to speak in church. Let me list five possible interpretations that all fit the evidence that do not prohibit all women from ministering in church. Some would say there were special circumstances and that this prohibition relates to a particular part or kind of service. Though some argue that, I don't think that's the best argument. There is an argument that this is actually a textual interpolation. That means that this was a scribal insertion. Believe it or not, there's quite a bit of textual support. When you look at the ancient manuscripts, you will find this little passage is not always where you see it in your English Bible. Because of this, there are many, even born-again Assemblies of God scholars, who don't think Paul wrote this, but that a scribe tucked it in later. It is possible that this verse is actually a quotation. When Paul writes 1 Corinthians, he is responding to reports of problems Numerous times he quotes and says, now concerning the things you wrote, quotes the problem and then refutes it. 
when you read this verse in the context with the verse following it, where Paul says, what? Do you think the word of God first came to you? Are you the people, you think you're the only ones who have the right answer? It is very possible that this is actually a quotation that Paul is refuting. The original manuscripts had no quotation marks. Those were all added by later editors. It is possible that Paul is talking of a problem of disruption, that Paul was for forbidding behavior that was disruptive to the worship service. We know that the only religions that women were allowed entrance into among the pagans um, were quite bizarre. And if that was the only idea they had about worship, it might be that they were bringing that bizarre behavior into the church after being recently converted. The fifth interpretive option is a problem of excess, that Paul was just limiting right behaviors done in excess. Read in the context, I think this is probably my choice interpretation. It seems most likely that what Paul is doing is silencing the perpetual questions of novice female converts at Corinth. In sum, then, this passage does not prohibit female leadership. But as the rest of the chapter, it simply encourages that all things be done decently and in order. The final passage I'd like to introduce is 1 Timothy 2, 11 through 15. Let a woman quietly receive instruction with entire submissiveness. I do not allow a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man but to remain quiet, for it was Adam who was first created and then Eve. It was not Adam who was deceived, but the woman being quite deceived fell into transgression. But women shall be saved or preserved through the bearing of children if they continue in faith and love and sanctity with self-restraint. Now from our previous lists of normative and descriptive texts, we know that this passage cannot be a universal prohibition of women's teaching or leadership of men, because again, Paul has praised them for doing that. Instead, it's referring to some local problem going on in Ephesus that needs to be corrected. It's important to look at the literary context of this prohibition. In light of the context immediate and in light of the whole book and in light of what we know from history, Paul wrote this book to help young Timothy confront problems in the church. But what were these problems? Timothy's conflicts seem to be combating heresy, perhaps Gnostic heresy, teachings that were being promulgated by women who were ignorant of the truth of the Christian faith and practice. Let me point out several insights that may help you understand this passage more. First of all, there's a strong tense. Let me point out the force of the tense. The significance of this insight is the present tense equals, at the present time, I'm not allowing. As it is in this present text, tense, this sentence should be translated, I am not allowing a woman to teach. That is, for the present time, under the present circumstances, I am not allowing a woman to teach. There is a different construction called the aorist, which would be a once and for all, I never have and never will. Paul's not using that construction. The implication based on the previous verse, but let her learn, is that when she has her theology straight, Paul will offer her an opportunity to share in ministry. Now this insight makes a lot of sense from what we know of Paul elsewhere. Remember the high praise for the multitude of women ministers? In fact, one of Paul's favorite female ministers is Priscilla, who with her husband Aquila, Paul left in Ephesus to pastor the church. We know that she taught Apollos, the great Alexandrian evangelist, in Ephesus, according to Acts 18. Timothy's congregation, the one he's writing to now, had a female pastor in its past who was left there by Paul. Obviously, when Paul, when, when Timothy and his congregation read this letter, they were, as all the churches of the saints, of the Gentiles, aware of Paul's high regard for women and their spiritual leadership. 
They had no problem understanding that Paul is limiting this prohibition to a certain particular problem. Let me point out the force of the verb. That usurping would be forbidden of a woman is to be expected because no one in the kingdom, whether male or female, is to dominate or exercise lordship over another. The Greek word to exercise authority over appears only once in the New Testament. Its traditional translation, usurp, is based then on this single literary context. In the case of a hapax legomena, a word that appears only once, we really have to go outside the New Testament to find out what it means. Dr. Catherine Krager, classicist, has done extensive study, 10 years of study on this word, and has found out that it often implies one taking a very strong initiative. It is a severe word with negative connotations even of abuse, violence, and murder. Her findings on the word, as well as studies on the unusual grammar of this verse, have been published in the book, I Suffer Not a Woman, co-authored by Richard and Catherine Krager, husband and wife. Now, there's no question that women should not play such a role in the church. Jesus would not even permit his original 12 male disciples to lord it over as the Gentiles do. So the, the point of interpretive insight B is to understand that no saint is to dominate over one another. Humble service is what spiritual leadership is all about. But yet this rare verb has other meanings as well that make even more sense in the historical context. We'll return to them in a moment. Let's look at the significance of the syntax, the unusual grammatical construction in this verse. This construction could actually be rendered, I am not allowing a woman to teach that she originated man. The two infinitives in Greek in this verse, to teach, to usurp, in Greek, an infinitive can be used as an indirect discourse, to teach that, and directly quoting the thing that she was teaching. This verse, therefore, could be rendered, I'm not allowing a woman to teach that. And we've already looked at the second infinitive, often translated usurp, but it's, it's a rare word. Among ancient uses of this word, Dr. Krager has found that it is often, especially in ancient religious texts, meant to originate, to bring into being, to author. In fact, the English word author is built on this verb, authenteo. Some Gnostics, and these were heretics, taught that Eve was created first and that Adam was taken out of her side they taught that Eve had not been deceived by the certain serpent, but enlightened by the fruit. They taught that Eve was the first one on earth who came to know the mystery of the ages, and it is from her that they derive their self-identity as Gnostics, the knowing ones. Aha! In light of that lexical, grammatical, and historical background, this passage could be rendered this way. I am not allowing a woman to teach that she originated man. If she doesn't know better, let her be silent. Such may be the Gnostic version of the creation story you're teaching in Ephesus, but it certainly isn't the authentic one that I demand be taught by all Christians. Now, let's get it straight, once and for all. It was Adam who came first, then Eve. Adam was not deceived, but the woman, far from being enlightened, de was deceived, and this act of rebellion did not result in her rise to divine status, but in her fall into transgression. Also, some of the Gnostics were very loose in their sexual morality, yet due to their body-spirit dichotomy, some Gnostics believed that bringing a child into the world will eternally damn you to spending eternity on earth and you'll never be able to go to heaven with your spirit. At times, the Gnostics, in spite their desires to the contrary, had conceptions occur. In such an event, they were in very, very bad trouble. 
Because if the child lived according to their theology, the parents would lose their salvation. Paul responds to that false theology in this next verse 15, as he further develops correct Christian theology in contradistinction to the Gnostics, saying, even though women bear children, they can be saved if they continue in faith, love, sanctity with self-restraint. In this passage, therefore, 1 Timothy 2, 11 through 15, Paul was forbidding the false teachers with whom Timothy was currently struggling, not all females forever. This text teaches that heretical women must not domineer authority, nor can they teach false doctrine. Paul forbids these false teachers in verses 11 and 12, and then he corrects their theology in verses 13 and 14, and he corrects their libertine practices in verse 15. What then should be the status of women in the church today? Biblical precedents still apply. What was normative for the early church must be normative for us. And contemporary models validate and perpetuate. God has called and gifted many notable women for the work of his ministry throughout modern history, and especially in these last days. He is pouring out his spirit on both male and female. Look at the numerous women in our charismatic and Pentecostal history of the 20th century and the 21st century. What then should be our response? To the degree that we are convinced of our Pentecostal distinctives, that is, that it is God who divinely calls and supernaturally anoints for ministry, when we're convinced of that, we will welcome the full use of women's gifts to all levels of ministry in our fellowship. As we enter this new millennium, I believe it's God's will for us to enter into this. Understanding that the Bible teaches equality, we ask women and men to submit to one another and to exercise their gifts in response to God's call upon their lives. Let us affirm and encourage those women called to ministry. Let us be open and responsive to such a call from God. As we enter this new millennium, I believe it is God's will for our day that we be included among his prophesying sons and daughters. God bless you. Well, we hope our viewers, both men and women, have a clearer understanding from Deborah Gill's presentation. Christ's work has no room for bickering as to who should be speaking, preaching, or teaching. Um, this is the responsibility of all called to fulfill their part of Christ's ministry. The Holy Spirit wants to give her gifts to a willing and enthusiastic people for a final witness to all the nations. The Apostle Paul says we need these spirit, those spiritual gifts from the Holy Spirit because they are for the profit of all Christians, not just for the hierarchical clergy. In 1 Corinthians 12, 1 to 7, he says, Now concerning the spiritual gifts, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be ignorant. You know that when you were, were pagans, somehow or other, you were influenced and led astray to mute idols. Therefore, I tell you that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus be cursed. And no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of workings, but the same God works all of them in everyone. Now to each, of, to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good or profit of all. No one person has all the gifts, but they are to be distributed by the Holy Spirit. We are encouraged to desire the gifts, but we need to also pursue God's love, which should come first, because we need God's love in us, and then to desire the spiritual gifts and especially to prophesy. Listen to what the Apostle Paul says about these things in 1 Corinthians 12, 
11 and verse 31. But one and the same spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually. But earnestly desire the best gifts, and yet I show you a better way. Then he goes on to 1 Corinthians 13, verses 1 to 3, and speaks about love. If I speak in human or angelic tongues, but have not love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and I have faith that I can move mountains, but I have not love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames, but I have not love, I gain nothing. The Apostle Paul says we need more of Christ's type of love so we can receive gifts from the Spirit. And in Philippians 2, 1 to 5, Paul says, if you have any encouragement from being united in Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Our attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. Well, uh, this is so, then why do traditionalists try to use unclear scriptural text to re retard God's work by forbidding women from speaking and preaching? One of the common hard texts that Deborah Gill points out is 1 Timothy 2, 11 through 15. By careful study of this text, it is obvious this text is unclear and should not be used to establish a doctrine to keep women out of the ministry. Deborah Gill encourages us to read Richard and Catherine Clark Crager's book, I Suffer Not a Woman, Rethinking 1 Timothy in Light of Ancient Evidence. For a more in-depth understanding of this particular text, we need to continue to study scripture and related works by scholars to make sure what these verses are really talking about. There are archaeological and historical records to shed light on what these verses really are saying. The other text mentioned by Deborah is 1 <coughs> Corinthians 14, 34 to 35. It seems to also forbid women from having part in Christ's ministry. But Deborah gives us several excellent reasons why this text cannot be used to keep women out of Christ's ministry. There are several other interesting books to read on these, ver on these verses to give a clearer understanding. They are Community 101 and Beyond Sex Roles by Gilbert Bilizikian, theologian and Greek scholar. Gilbert gives an inspired explanation of the so-called hard text verses. Gretchen Gabelin Hall, another discerning uh, scholar, also gives us an excellent explanation in her heart of these hard texts in her well-written Golden Award book, Equal to Serve. Women and men working together, revealing the gospel. These present-day scholars reveal the truth about these verses to the average person in terms they can understand. It's amazing that the Orthodox traditionalists would continue to try to use them to keep women out of the ministry of Jesus Christ. But they do. God's word warns that there would be those who would bring in erroneous theologies. Listen to what Peter says some would be doing in 2 Peter 2.1. But there were false prophets among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. They will secretly, secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the sovereign Lord who brought them, bringing swift destruction on themselves. We are members of the church individually and equally. There is to be no hierarchy of men over women. Those ideas came from uninspired men and not from the Holy Spirit. Jesus warns us about what might happen to us because of some um, of refusing to do as he teaches. He says in Matthew 24, 9 to 13, then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death, and you will be hated by all nations because of me. And that at that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and deceive many. Because of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold, but whoever stands firm till the end will be saved. We are not to be fooled by those that twist the Apostle Paul's teachings to their own destruction. Men and women as co-workers with Christ are to study scripture so they will be well grounded in the good truths of God. Listen to what the Apostle Paul has to say to Timothy, to Timothy and to us today in 2 Timothy 3, 12 through 14 and verse 16. In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. 
while evildoers and impostors will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But after you continue, it, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know that those from whom you've learned it. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that God's servants may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. New Testament scriptures are inspired by God to encourage all humans, both men and women, to work together in Christ's priesthood of all believers. Scripture should be used to heal family relations and to make God's calling of women clear so the gospel can be readily preached by many capable women who are ready and willing to work for Christ. Catherine Crager, Catherine Clark Crager and James R. Beck's book, Women Abuse and the Bible, is another important book that encourages women to step out in faith and follow their Lord Jesus Christ. This book points to the same age-old problem of patriarchy as the main reason for abuse and the keeping of women out of Christ's ministry. Listen to what Catherine Crager says in chapter 1 on page 17. The inherent logic of patriarchy says that since men have the right to dominance and control, they also have the right to enforce that control. It is this control over component of patriarchy and its assumptions of ownership of women and children by men that make it vulnerable to violence and abuse, not only against women and children, but also against the earth and its resources. Helfer and Kemp, 1968 in their book, The Battered Child, report that the assault rate on children of parents who subscribe to the belief of male dominance is 136% higher than for couples not committed to male dominance. Jesus Christ will not accept patriarchy as an excuse for men to dominate and abuse women. Jesus Christ gave his life for both men and women so they can be equal partners in his priesthood of all believers. Patriarchy replaced God's way of oneness when even Adam sinned in the Garden of Eden. God's plan of reconciliation is to restore that oneness. Jesus said he is the way to all truth, and we must be diligently seeking the truth. Listen to what he said in John 4, 23 through 24. Yet a time is coming and now has come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit and his worshipers must worship in spirit and truth. Remember, we need to be about God's work of preaching the gospel to all of the world. This can be achieved more effectively when both men and women are working together in Christ's egalitarian ministry. Listen to what Jesus commissions and commands us to do in Matthew 28, 19 to 20. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the end of the age. So, so long, long until, until next time. time.